My father, on literally on July Fourth this year, passed away, and he 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 was ninety eight, and uh, so in in fairness, perhaps there are some good genes that are involved in that process. But but one of the things that made my dad so outstanding was his mindset, how how he thought, and uh, so I'm going to give you two or three things about seventy three, and uh, it's by the way, it's a very good age. It's it's a you know. Uh, I, I have I, I I have valued all of my years, but I love where I am right now. I, I think every age has a, a real plus side to it if you really maximize it. And you know there are four things when I look at seventy three and where I am and and what I'm able to do. Um, and one of them would be intentional living. I think that uh, I think many people are not intentional in their uh, life. Uh, many people, uh, they kind of accept their life instead of lead it. And I'm very passionate. In fact, I wrote a book called Intentional Living. I'm very passionate about um, living a life uh, of which you make choices in your life that are going to really be an asset to you. Uh, my, one of my mentors was John Wooden, as you know. And he was a, a, a brilliant, brilliant uh, leader. And a great coach, and and he he would say to me often, "There is a choice you have to make in everything you do. So keep in mind that in those choices, the choices make you." And uh, what I what I discovered is just a, it's a fact that that if you're intentional and you look at life, um, you know, growing older is automatic, uh, getting better is not. And uh, so, you know, we, there are people that are 73 and they automatically got here, but they weren't intentional. And because they weren't intentional, um, their their life lacks what I would call meaning, fulfillment, significance. And uh, I've really, really made it a habit to understand that the choices I make and um, the intentional, you know, turning my turning good intentions into good actions. So often, again, you know, people just live a life of good intentions, and you know, it's always someday, someday. You know, well, you know, one of these days really becomes none of these days. It's just a matter of of of, of one day waking up and realizing, you know, one of these days never happened. And, and I think so many times we just kind of assume, you know, tomorrow has an incredible way of sneaking up on us until all of a sudden, you know, you say, "Wow, it's here!" and a tear, and I didn't do what I needed to do, and didn't make the choices and take the actions I needed to make. So, I think intentional living uh, in that I wrap into that being intentional in my personal growth, be intentional in in trying to find and fulfill my purpose in life. All of that I would put into that that area of intentional living. Uh, another, th- I, I think, another thing that ha- allows a person to grow older better. Uh, in fact, I often say I want to. I want to uh, die old at a ripe young age, and uh, uh, and and so one of the things I think that makes it better for us is, um, or for me, is anticipation. Um, when people ask me, you know, how, how did you write over eighty books, and and we have you know seven companies in the John Maxwell Enterprise, and and I get up. 5.30 every morning, 5 to 5.30, and I start my writing. And, and people say, well, you must be very self-disciplined. And I share with them, really, Ismail, that no, I, I'm not that self-disciplined. I'm just full of anticipation. And, and what that does for me is is that that awakens me. I, I, I anticipate that when I sit down and literally take my legal pad and my four-color pen, because that's how I write. I still write Neanderthal. And, uh, I, I, you know, I, I can hardly wait to write because my whole purpose in life is to add value to people. So while I'm writing, I, I'm anticipating who's going to read this, who's going to benefit from this, uh, good decisions that are going to be made because of this. And, and so it's anticipation that that not only gets me up in the morning, it's anticipation that keeps me going. And I think that the moment we lose that that exciting edge about our life that we no longer anticipate. And by the way, 
anticipation will always disappoint. Now, this is a very important point that I've, in fact, I've never even taught it, but it's just, uh, it's coming to me right now. Anticipation is, is, is um, very unfulfilling if everything you anticipate benefits you personally. So if I'm anticipating perhaps that that somebody's going to be good to me or somebody's going to be nice to me or somebody's you know I'm going to you know I'm going to reap something wonderful uh, that that is that anticipation is very short lived but the anticipation of adding value to others serving others making other people's lives better it's expansive it, when whenever I get into thinking of others, my world expands. When I begin to think about myself, my world begins to contract. And I think that when people get older, that one of the big issues and problems is is that their world begins to contract. It gets smaller instead of bigger. And, And it begins to get smaller because it's all about them. And if it's all about me, there's just going to be an incredible amount of lost opportunities and disappointments in my life. But if it's about others, then you know it, there's a there's a sense of of look what I'm doing and look who I'm helping, and so anticipation is really uh, it's a better word than to me than self discipline. Self discipline is almost like okay I I get up at five thirty in the morning but you know, I, I it, it, here here's the difference. Self discipline is I have to get up at five thirty in the morning. Got a lot of work to do. Anticipation is I get to get up at five thirty in the morning. I can hardly wait to get to my work and and, and so. I think that my life has been a very um, exciting life because it's been filled with anticipation, but it's not about anticipation about my life being better. It's about me making other people's lives better. So if you put intentional living with anticipation and then relationships, um, I think relationships are essential. Um, I have great friends. And I, and I have people, in fact, I just finished right before I came here to the studio to, to be with you. And community health group, I, I uh, you know, I was at a two-hour meeting with with some of my team, and we were discussing all the good things and the, that are happening in the organization. And I'm thinking to myself, it's wonderful to make a difference, but it's even more wonderful to make a difference with people you love, and with people that you really care for, and with people that really care for me. And and I don't know, I, it just doesn't seem very fulfilling for me to cross the finish line by myself or to have a, a victory or a win by myself. I don't know. I mean, who do you celebrate with? I want to celebrate with people I care for. And uh, so so relationships, I think, play a very vital and in, integral part in my life that brings tremendous fulfillment. I mean, I just have people that, you know, I love them and they love me and we do it together and um, we enjoy um adding value to each other, helping each other, and giving each other the credit for it. So uh, relationships make seventy the age of 73 worth fulfilling. And, and then, you know, Simon Sinek wrote a great book. I don't know if you've read it, Ismail, but if you haven't, and, and you that are listening to me, he wrote a book called The Infinite Game. And Simon is a good friend, and um, it's just a phenomenal book. And basically, it's a book about the fact that there are some people that they play a finite game. And, and if they play a finite game, it evolves them, and it started when they started, and it ends when they end, and there's kind of like a finish line. And I don't believe that is true. I believe that we play an infinite game. I don't think there is a finish line. And uh, in fact, let me put it this way. For some people, if, if you have a finish line, when you cross it, you finished. You're finished. It's over. And I think a lot of people get to my age and they've crossed their finish line. They've they had a, a retirement time. They 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 set deadlines and they set they made endings. They end the, you know the book's over, and, and at that moment I think they lose that incredible energy that that they could have used to continue on. But 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 they stopped. And and when you stop, all of a sudden you know it's what I call advanced attraction. That that once I know who I am and once I know what I want, if I start moving that all of a sudden I began to attract all these positive things that allow me to fulfill the vision I have. Just as if I am not moving, all the resources, all the opportunities, they began to fade away. And, and I, I say, wow, why am I not getting the opportunities? Well, it's because, you know, you, you, you stopped moving. I was at a friend's birthday party last night, really a good friend. 
And uh, so he was giving, you know, some of it, my, it, his favorite quotes of mine. And, and he said, I think my all-time favorite one is that, you know, we're supposed to leave footprints in the sands of time. And he said, but he said, most people, they leave butt prints in the sands of time. They, they're, you know, and, and, and when you play an infinite game, there are no butt prints to it. it it's continually moving. And, 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 and that finish line, is, it, it's, it's never going to be, you're never going to reach it. I, I, I'm never, you know, when I came into this world, the game had already started. When I leave this world, the game is going to continue. And so there's no finish line. So I think if you put those four things together, I think if you put, you know, my intentional living, my in- sense of anticipation, my uh, wonderful friends and relationships that I built and that I play an infinite game, at 73, it's, it's a good age. And uh, those are those are not all, but those are four, I think, essential core ingredients in my life that allows me to love right where I am right now. For the next, I don't know, 20 minutes, I'm going to share with you my best advice. And my best advice, if, if I just had one day to spend with you, or in this case, if I had just a few minutes to spend with you, what I would say to you is, if you want to do well, if you want to have a legacy, leave a legacy, have legs to your legacy, I want you to live an intentional life. That's the key. You see, most people, they don't live intentionally. They don't live on purpose. You know, most people, you know, they, they, they don't lead their life. They, they accept their life. And because of that, they, they never reach their potential. And I would encourage you to intentionally live your life for several reasons. And I'll give you just a couple very quickly. Number one is the fact that the, if you, the best way to improve your life is to live an intentional life. And the reason for that is, is very, is very simple. Intentional living moves you from good intentions to good actions. And, and good intentions probably is the most overrated two words in the English language. No one has ever had any improvement with just good intentions. No, 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 nobody's ever had their lives changed with good intentions. No, p- people, you, you, you've never added value to people with just good intentions. Good intentions has no action in it. We, we want to go from good intentions to good actions. You see, the great dividing line in life between people who do well and people who don't do well is they cross that bridge. They go from, I intend to do something to I did something. They cross that intentional living bridge. My mentor, John Wooden, for so many years, would look at his basketball players. He was a great coach at UCLA, and he he would say to them, now, don't tell me what you're going to do. Show me what you're going to do. And what he was saying is, you could talk all day about what you want to do to improve your world, but it doesn't improve your world. You gotta, you gotta do something that improves your, your world. You see, one of the greatest gaps in life is the gap between sounding good and doing good. And intentional living improves your life because the moment you intentionally live, now you are, 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 you're doing good. It moves you from my desire to my action. It moves you from someday to today. It takes you from being passive to becoming active. It takes you from occasional to continual. And I'll tell you what it does. It takes you from dreaming to doing. So it's the greatest way to improve your life. And I can tell you also, it, it teaches you and me to be up to have what I call front end thinking. If I'm going to have an intentional life, that means I have to have some intentional thinking on the front end. An, an intentional life is not something that just quote happens. It's not something you just wake up and say, "Wow, okay, I'm I'm living in." No, no, no. You see, what what precedes intentional living is intentional thinking. I wrote a book on how successful people think. And, and I, in that book, I talked about the differences between successful and unsuccessful people. And, and, and the successful people, one of the things they do is they think up front. And one of the things I love about Uplift is, is that it is thinking big picture. It's thinking up front. It's saying if we're going to really change our world, we're going to have to go go into kids' lives and, and get to the younger generation. I, intentional living causes me to make every day count. It doesn't allow me to skip a day. Oops, what happened? You know, sometimes life just sneaks up on people. But the moment that I'm intentional, I realize that that I want to make every day my masterpiece. And I want to do every day. I want to make, I want to make every day count. And it, and it keeps me from 
procrastinating. And, and again, it, you know, what's, what's the great gap? It's the great gap between knowing and doing. And, and, and knowing never gets us anywhere. Doing gets us everywhere. And then, you know, intentional living, it allows us to make our changes one step at a time. We can't change everything. We're not even supposed to try to change everything at once. But when I become intentional, I look and say, okay, what can I change, okay? And what's the most important thing for me to work on right now in my life? What What is it that I can do that can really start improving my life? And so what I want to do for the remainder of this small teaching that I'm giving is to is to share with you how you can begin to improve your life, how you can begin to be intentional. I mean, what steps do I take right now since we're leaving intentions and going to actions? What steps can I take right now just, that just begins to uplift my life? How do I do that? Well, get ready because I'm going to give it to you right now. I want to encourage you, first of all, uh, to be intentional in your growth. I am so thankful because when I was young, in my 20s, I had a mentor walk into my life and just basically ask me if I had a growth plan. I did not. And he said to me these words that changed my life. He said, growth is not automatically automatic. You don't become automatically better. If you're going to really personally grow and develop yourself, you have to be intentional. And then he explained to me, he said, John, you, we automatically become older, but we don't automatically become better. Wow, that's a life change, isn't it? And so as I'm automatically getting older, I want to be intentional about getting better in that process. And I'm just going to say to you that that I would encourage you to, to, to develop a, a personal growth plan for your life. And, and what I mean very simply is, Every day, uh, uh, have growth experiences. Every day, read growth material. Every day, practice growth things. And and, and you'll begin to understand that the only guarantee, the only guarantee that the future is going to be better than today is that you're growing today. I'm 73. And I still, every day, intentionally learn and and develop myself and and, and grow. And, And again, that's one of the things I love about uplift and, and, and what you're doing is, is is that you're you're impressing upon a younger generation that they're going to have to be intentional in their growth. And if they are, it's huge life change. My father knew that. And when I entered into the seventh grade, I'm I'm the middle child. I have an older brother, younger sister. When my when my brother entered the seventh grade, when I entered the, when my sister Trish entered the seventh grade. My father sat down with us and said, now, from seventh grade through high school, I, I want to pour into you. He, he began to teach us how to intentionally grow. And he would pick books out for us to read. And, and he would pay us to read those books. In fact, whatever the book cost, that's what he would pay us when we finished reading it. And every night at the dinner table, we'd have family discussion about what we were reading. Now, all of my friends, they didn't, they didn't get paid to read good books. My friends got paid to do chores. In fact, I went to my dad one time and said, Dad, I, I think I ought to get paid to do chores, don't you? He said, no, that's a terrible idea. No, no, no. He said, you, you do chores because you're part of the family and you don't get paid to be part of the family. He, he said, you, 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 why would I pay you to be a gar- to take out the garbage unless I want you to grow up and be a garbage man? He said, I, I pay you to read good books. And, and so from the 7th, 8th, ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th grade, the three of us children, we, we just read good books. And by the time we graduated, we were already on our way. My, my father understood. Put him on a growth plan. Be intentional in your personal development and growth. As I look back, I could say that no doubt about it, I got the fast start towards success in life because the books that I read that my father paid me an allowance to read when I grew up. I would encourage you not only to be intentional in your growth, I'd in- I encourage you to be intentional in your attitude. I-, I just want you to know that your attitude that you have right now is a choice. That's why I never feel sorry for people who have a bad attitude, because they chose it. Which means if you chose a bad attitude, you could <laughs> unchoose, if that's a word, the bad attitude, and choose a good one. And the moment I realized that it was a choice, then it makes me responsible. It makes you responsible to have a good attitude. And you say, well, John, if you knew my adversity, if you knew my difficulty, you'd have a bad attitude. No, no, no. I know people who have grown up in very difficult, difficult situations. 
that they've had and chosen a great attitude. I talked to a, I talked to a very successful person yesterday. His name is Jason, and, and he told me that when he was 14, he listened. This is a long time ago. He, he listened to a tape of mine on leadership and attitude, and, and he looked at his mom and said, I want more of those tapes. I want to hear him some more. And, and he basically said, 14, 15, 16 years of age, he said, I just consumed your books and consumed your, your teachings. And, and he said, where I am today is because I made that decision as a, at a very, very young age. I'm just here to say to you that your attitude is the difference maker. I didn't say attitude is everything. I just said it's the main thing. And a good, great, positive attitude, an attitude of adding value to people, an attitude of of significance, all that stuff is just going to increase and improve who you are and the legacy that you create. I I would encourage you to, to be intentional in your relationships. It's so true. It is so true. And I, again, when I was young, when I was young, I, I, I had a, a, a mentor walk into my life, and this was just huge. He just said, John, in five years, you will become the person that, based on the books you read and, 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 the, and the people you hang with. And, and did I, little did I realize how important that was. What, what am I reading? What am I learning? Hey, what podcast am I listening to? Who's influencing me right now? Your your relationships are so key to your success. In fact, if you took your five closest friends and looked at them, pretty much where they're going is where you're going. You got to ask yourself, is that where I want to go? I, I would encourage you to be intentional in your leadership because everything rises and falls on leadership. And and, and I just love the fact that that you can learn to lead at a very young age. I, I would encourage you, I would encourage you. I wrote a book called Developing the Leader Within You 2.0. And that book has 10 things that you want to, to work on, to learn, to grow in, to be a good leader. It's, it's, it's kind of like the, the practical leadership book that you just begin to read it and you begin to say, okay, I, 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 can, I, I can do this. And, and you begin to learn and you begin to grow in, in, in your leadership itself. And then I, w- I would encourage you to uh, be intentional in your significance. This is probably my favorite part of the entire lesson because I, 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 want, you to be, I want you to be successful, but there's a difference between being successful and being significant. I think I kind of learned that again in my 20s when I heard my friend Zig Ziglar say that if you'll help other people in life get what they want, that everything that you want, you'll receive. But his emphasis was instead of trying to get what you want first, help other people get what they want. In other words, he was saying, Live a significant life because a significant life is always about others, adding value to others. A successful life, which I hope you're successful also, is all about adding value to yourself. But what you want to do is you want to make sure that you live a significant life. You want to make sure that you are constantly adding value to others. And one of the things I learned is the fact that selfishness and significance, they're not compatible at all. If I'm a selfish person, I'm going to ask people to add value to me. If I'm a significant person, I'm going to every day ask, who can I add value to? So because I'm honored to be talking to the next great generation. I'm honored to be talking to to people that have your life entirely in front of you. I just want to share with you that if you'll do five things every day, you'll lead intentionally this significant life. And I want that for you. And trust me, you'll not only have a personal uplift, you'll bring an uplift to all those around you. Every day I do five things. Take good notes now. Listen carefully. Integrate what I'm about to share with you in your life. Trust me, it'll move you to significance. Every day, number one, 
I value people. That's the core. That's the foundation. You will not add value to people unless you value people. In fact, if I don't value you, if I devalue you, I'll never add value to you. So it starts with valuing people. Now, you have to understand I'm a person of faith. And I think the greatest leader, whether you're a person of faith or not, I think you could maybe acknowledge that at least one of the greatest leaders that ever lived was Jesus. And if you look at the life of Jesus, one of the things that stands out about who he was and how he so beautifully changed lives and possibly affected people is that he valued everyone. When you came into the influence of Jesus, you knew he loved you unconditionally. You knew he valued you. So every day, I value people. That's where it all starts. Now, the moment that I value people, I can go to the second thing I do every day, and that is every day I think of ways to add value to you. So, so when I knew I was going to be with Uplift today, that I'd be talking to Joe and I'd be talking to you, I asked myself, how can I add value to you? And then I, Joe and I had a amazing conversation of which I talked to him about I lead and I talked to him about youth curriculum that teaches great values and how that we could come alongside and serve you and add value to you. Well, <coughs> when I looked at my calendar this morning and realized I would be teaching you today, my first question is, okay, what can I do? I began to think, how can I add value to you? Who will I see? How can I add value to you? On the front end of your day, every day, look and say, okay, who am I going to come in contact with? What is it that I can say to them? What is it that I can do for them? What resource can I give them that will add value to them? Become a plus in your life. You see, each one of us, we're either a plus in the, in the lives of others and we're adding value to them, or to be honest with you, we're a minus in their lives and we're not adding value to them. So every day, I value people every day. I think of ways to add value to people. I do that at the beginning of my day as I looked at my calendar. And number three, I look for ways to add value to people. Wow. And by the way, who we are determines how we see others. And so if I am looking for ways to add value to you, Guess what? I'll see ways to add value to you when I'm with you because I'm looking for them. Just like if I'm not looking for them, I won't find them. We see not what is in front of us. We see what we're prepared to see. We're see we see what we're passionate to see. So every day I value people, think of ways to add value to people, look for ways to add value to people. Number four, every day I do things that add value to people. In other words, now I cross that line and I go into action. In fact, every evening, just like every morning, I look at my calendar and say, who will I add value to today intentionally? Every night, I look at the people I saw, and I ask myself the every night question, who did I add value to today? I make myself accountable. Who did I help? Who was I a plus for today? So every day, I value people, think of ways to add value to people, look for ways to add value to people, do things that add value to people. And number five, every day I encourage others. I encourage others to add value to others. And I'm doing that to you right now. I want uplift to expand because the principles, the values, the idea, the mission, the vision, it's all so good. So you got to spread it. And how do you spread it? By being contagious, loving what you do, and having joy in what you do in such a way that people say, oh my gosh, whatever you got, I want it too. I want it too. I, I lead a lot of international trips, and, 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 and I take my coaches, we have a coaching company, I take them with me. And we go to different countries, and, and we spend maybe four or five hard days working in, in, in training uh, facilitators to to facilitate transformation tables. We'll, 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 in four days, we can, we've trained 25,000 transformation table facilitators. So they, they pay their own way and, and they give up a lot to go there and they, they're going to add value to people. And I tell them, I know you came to add value to these people, but I want you to know that by the end of the trip, they will have added more value to you. This is, this is what happens when you intentionally add value to people. 
the value received just becomes ridiculously compounded. And the statement I give them and I leave with you today in my talk is I share with them, once you have tasted significance, in other words, once you have lived a life of adding value to people, once you've tasted significance, success will never satisfy. And that's the truth. So for uplift, I pray for, wish for, dream for, hope for you to keep living lives of significance and adding value to people, and especially the younger generation. I'm delighted today to talk to you about some of the laws of leadership. And the first one I want to talk to you about is truly the first one I should talk to you about. Now, there are 15 of them, but you have to understand there's one that I think is foundational for the other 14. Not more important, but foundational, and that's the law of intentionality. And that's where we're going to begin today. The law of intentionality just basically says growth is the only guarantee that tomorrow is going to get better. Oh, isn't that good? <laughs> if you're going to grow, and, and if I'm going to grow, we're, we're going to grow intentionally. Now, I'm talking to leaders today. I love talking to, to people that lead many people. And to be honest with you, if, if I could just literally come off the stage and, 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 and I could get real close to you and we could have kind of like a one-on-one -on -one conversation. There are two questions that I would ask you, and the two questions I'm about to ask you will really determine how successful you're going to be in this business without any question. These are the two questions. It's not like there's three or there's four or there's seven. There's two. Okay? Just trust me on this. I'm an old man. I know this. I've been around the block a few times. And there are two questions that if you can answer in a positive way about yourself, you're going to be very successful. And if you really cannot answer that in a positive way, to be honest with you, you're not going to be near as successful as you would like to be. And the first question is very simple. What are you doing to develop yourself? And if you'd say, "Boy, gosh, John, I'll tell you right now, I'm doing a lot to develop myself. I, I mean, I've got a personal growth plan, and, and I'm intentional in this, and I'm, I'm doing this on a daily deal. If you could say that to me, then I'd say, hey, we're, we're in good shape here. We're, we're in good shape because that's the key. You know, what are, what are you doing to develop yourself? And, and by the way, the reason that's first is not because you want to be selfish. It's kind of like almost a selfish question. person says, well, why do I start with myself? The reason you start with yourself is because you cannot give what you do not have. So you better start with yourself. Because if you're leading others and have nothing to give them, nothing to share with them, nothing to teach them, then I can promise you, you'll never be what you want to be as a leader. And I can promise you that after 40 years of personal growth, the secret of any success, if I've had any success at all, the secret of that success has been personal growth in my life. And, and growth has, has literally placed me where I am. So, so what are you doing to develop yourself? It's a huge question. And the 15, laws of, uh, of the 15 laws of personal growth, basically these laws are all about developing yourself and developing the second question, what are you doing to develop others? You, you see, on the first question, you're foundational for your future. The second question is all about compounding multiplication. That's where you build a huge business, when you know how to develop other people. And what we have to understand about the law of intentionality is that you cannot develop yourself and you cannot develop your people unless you're intentional. And I discovered that in my 20s when I sat down and had breakfast with a guy named Kirk Kampmeyer at the Holiday Inn in Lancaster, Ohio, and he asked me the question, John, do you have, do you have a plan for personal growth in your life? Didn't have a plan. Didn't know I was supposed to have a plan. Nobody ever told me I was supposed to have a plan. I graduated. I was working hard, doing my very best to reach my potential. But nobody ever walked in my life until Kirk Kampmeyer did and said, John, do you have a plan for personal growth in your life? And I didn't have one. I was embarrassed. I thought back then I had to have answers. And so I acted as if I did. And that didn't really work very long. I was kind of like a plane circling the airfield trying to come in for a landing. Found I just shut up and landed that plane. And he looked at me, and I'll never forget, he said, you don't have a plan, do you? 
And I said, no, I don't have a plan. And then he said to me, John, growth is not automatic. If you're going to have to grow, you're going to have to grow on purpose. That day, my life was changed. What, what Kurt was saying is, if you're going to grow, you have to be intentional. I mean, it, 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 start, it starts with me. So the problem is we have what I call growth gaps. The reason that we're not intentional in our growing is there are just some gaps that, that keep us from, from getting to where we need to go. And I'm going to give you about a half a dozen of them really quickly. The, the first one is, is the assumption gap. And the assumption gap just basically says, or is I assume that I'll grow automatically. You see, most people, they live by assumption. 99% of people today are assuming, just assuming, that somehow they'll get better. Very sad, folks, very sad. Because let me tell you something about assumption. Assumption is a huge disappointment in life. You show me a person that assumes, and I'll show you a person that almost daily is disappointed. So the the first gap is a gap that leaves many people short, and that's just a pure assumption gap. The second one is is the knowledge gap. And and the knowledge gap is is basically, I I don't know how to grow, and we've all been there. In other words, okay, I know that I need to be intentional in my growth, but I really don't don't know how to grow. I've been there. I mean, this this is worth this whole lesson, if you can just get this. The reason I'm so passionate about personal growth is personal growth keeps me prepared. In other words, if I'm continually growing, I'm continually developing myself, and I'm continually learning, and I'm continually doing new things and, and going to a, another step higher, can I tell you what that is? That, that constant growth is the preparation for the opportunity. So when the opportunity comes, it's, I, 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 here's the way. You don't go into an opportunity. You grow into an opportunity. And so I'm passionate about personal growth because for that person who says, wow, I, I, I had an opportunity. I wasn't ready. If you're growing, you're always ready. Because after I intentionally started growing, I made a commitment to grow as a leader. I started writing. I became an author. I developed growth resources for other people. I founded my first company. I began training conferences. Everything I can think of that has ever been good in my life was a result of the fact that I started personal growth in my life. I know. I know I'm known for leadership. I understand that. But my passion in life, more than anything else, is personal growth. Because if, if you grow personally, you can be a great leader. If, but if you don't grow personally, you can't be a good leader. Everything in life, everything in life that you're ever going to want is based upon your ability to develop yourself. So Kirk Kampmeyer said, John, um, you, you, you can't just accidentally grow. You've got to grow on purpose. And so I started and I got to thinking yesterday when I was getting ready to kind of my last preparation for this lesson, I, 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 I got started. And guess what? When I got started, let me tell you what I didn't have. I didn't have experience. I didn't have knowledge. I did not have a model. I did not have a mentor. I did not have a plan. I did not have a fellow traveler. I did not have resources. I did not have money. I did not have a growth environment. But I got started. You don't stop or not start because of what you don't have. You don't start because you don't realize yet that the fruit of everything good in life begins with a challenge. There's nothing easy in life, worthwhile in life. Everything is a pill that's worthwhile. And, and, and there's, it's not going to come to you, and it's not going to fall in your lap, and it's not going to be something that, oh, my gosh, I, it just was so simple. It's always going to be difficult. So how do we go from growth doesn't just happen to making growth happen? I thought I, I would share with you um, a practice that I have in my own life. It's, a, it's a, a practice I've done now for over 20 years. The last week of the year, I set it aside just for time of reflection, prayer, and, and, and reevaluating my year. 
And then I take my calendar, and I literally go over my calendar, uh, not only day by day, but hour by hour. Uh, every, every day I go every hour, and, and this is the person I met there, and this is what I was doing here. And as I, as I go through the calendar, I just keep my legal pad beside me, and I, I write down things like, wow, that, that, was, a, that, was, a, that was a good day. Uh, oh, this was a, this, I didn't do well here. I, this was, I, I, I would like to have a do-over here. Do, do you ever have times when you want to have a do-over? Uh, there, and I, uh, and I, I just I put things in different categories. Uh, uh, times where I really sensed that, that, that there was a, a real blessing of God on my life, the times when, when I felt that I was living too much for myself. And I mean, I go through a very, th- it, takes me, it really takes me the week. I just evaluate it. I, one of the things I do is I take every special thing that Margaret and I did during that year, and I put it together. And then one night during that week, I, I pull her aside for dinner, and I, I sit down with my list, and I go through everything we did all year that was very special. And, and it's just, it's a time for me to reflect. It's a time for me to to evaluate, to look at my year. And it's from that that I form my next year as far as I put down, okay, this year, uh, here are lessons I learned from last year. Some of them I don't want to repeat. Some of them I certainly want to do more. Here's people I should spend more time with. This is something I should be thinking more on. And I I lay out my entire year based upon the reflection of, of last year. And I ask God during this time for one word, that would help me in the new year. Just one word. You say, why one word? It's because I'm not smart enough to handle a sentence. <laughs> and a paragraph would be just off the charts for me. So I ask him for one word, and, and, and uh, that's something I just every day think upon and pray about, and, and, and usually toward, toward the end of the week, it, it begins to form. And the, and the word that came to my heart this year that I think God wants me to focus on in 2015 is the word intentional. He, he wants me to be intentional. He wants me to, maybe more than ever before in my life, really focus on some things that are important and, 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 and live a life every day, not a, a, a day that kind of where I try to accept my day, but a, but a day where I lead my day, where a day where I, I focus on making sure that I really really put my intentionality where it needs to be. We, we, we all heard the expression, all is well that ends well. I, I'm here to tell you all is well that begins well. And this is the first of the year, and for many of you, this is, this is your chance. This is your shot. This is your moment. This is your time. This is your opportunity. All of you that are watching online, the different campuses, Daystar, this is your opportunity. This is your time. This is your moment. This is your place for you to really begin to live an intentional life. And then I ask usually for a scripture that goes with it, and, and, and so let's kind of dive in on, on, on the screen. You'll see that the section I'm going to deal with, Matthew chapter 6, is all about focus and faith. In other words, trust God and see things correctly. Be intentional. Okay, let's go with the passage of scripture. Matthew chapter 6. If God gives such attention to the appearance of wildflowers, most of which have never been seen, don't you think he'll attend to you, take pride in you, do his best for you? What I'm trying to do here is to get you to relax, to not be so preoccupied with getting so that you can respond to God's giving. People who don't know God and the way that he works fuss over these things, but you know both God and how he works. Steep your life in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. Don't get worked up about what you may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. Intentional living means two things. In this scripture, intentional living means, first of all, knowing God and how he works. Jesus was very clear to say to us that if we want to live an intentional life, we have to know God and we have to know how he works in our lives. I love the passage in Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23. Don't let the wise brag on their wisdom. Don't let the heroes brag on their exploits. 
Don't let the rich brag on their riches. If you brag, brag of this and this only, that you understand and know me. In other words, he, he, he said, if you're, going to, if you're going to get excited about something, if you're going to brag about something, don't brag about what you got, what you did, where you've been, who you know. Just brag on the fact you know him. In fact, I'll tell you what's fantastic. It's not the fact that I know him. It's the fact that he knows me. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it, that God, the creator, God, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient God, he knows me, and he knows you. And, and, and Jesus said, if you want to live an intentional life, you've got to, you've got to know God and you've got to know the works of God. And, and, and you, you've, got to, you've got to live in his life and, and you've got to have him fully, you've got to be submerged in who he is and what he's wanting to do in your life. So what does that mean, knowing God and knowing how he works? First of all, it means that God values you. If, if, if you know God at all, you know that God values you. In fact, look at your neighbor you're sitting beside right now and, and, and just say to, them, say to them, God values you. Tell them that right now. God values you. A couple of years ago, I was privileged to open, do the opening session at the United Nations in New York. And so I was speaking to all the leaders, the ambassadors of every country, and, and I wanted to be sure to give them a message that, they could, that would really help them with their, with their countries. And, and so I, I did a lesson that was basically entitled, Three Questions Every Follower Ask of a Leader. And I shared with them, regardless of their culture, regardless of, uh, of where they were in the world, I would promise them that the people of their country, every leader within that country, they would be asking their leaders these three questions. And the three questions are simple. Do you care for me? If somebody's going to follow you, they want to know if you care for them. Who wants to, who wants to follow somebody that doesn't care for them? Can you help me? And in other words, is it going to get better if I follow you? If, if, if I get in the leadership line, is it going to improve my life? Can, can you help me? And thirdly, can I trust you? In every culture, in every society, in every nation, people ask those three questions of their leaders all the time. Do you love me? Can you help me? Can I trust you? And the greatest leader of all, Jesus can say a resounding yes on all three. He, he, can, he can help you. He loves you. And you can trust him. And when you follow Jesus through the Gospels, the thing that impresses you the most about Jesus is that he valued people. Jesus valued people. Turn the pages of all four Gospels. Everywhere you go, you see that Jesus valued people. The conflict between Jesus and the Pharisees was very simple. They valued knowledge, and he valued people. They valued what they knew about the Scriptures. They were always thinking that life composed of a Bible quiz. And Jesus said, wait a minute, you don't understand. you got to value people. you gotta, you got to see people, and, and, and there are so many examples of Jesus valuing people, but the one I love so much is the one that we know so well, the prodigal son. We know all about him messing his whole life up. He's in a pig pen now, He's asking himself, what's a Jewish boy like me in a pig pen? And he says, I, I, I'm going to go home to my dad. And, and, but he's, he said, if I'm going to go home to my dad, I've got to have a speech prepared because I've certainly messed up my life. And his speech was very simple. He said, I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against God. I've sinned against you. I don't deserve to be called your son. And he practiced it. And I know he practiced it because if you follow the story, it says when he came to his father, he fell down and he immediately said this speech. I mean, he had been practicing all the way, all the way back to the father's house. He was saying to himself, I don't do, I, 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 I've, I've sinned against God. I've sinned against you. I, I don't deserve to be called your son. I've sinned against God. I've sinned against you. I don't deserve to be your son. I've sinned against God. I've sinned against you. I don't deserve. He practiced, practiced it. And when he got to the father, he just fell down and he's, he, he gets his speech out. Oh, I, I don't deserve. I don't deserve to be your son. I, I, there were only two people that believed that he didn't deserve to be called his father's son. The prodigal that was on his knees in a repentant stage and the older religious brother. 
who said, you know, I've worked so hard and I've, I, I've done so much for you, Father, and, and, and you're giving a party to, 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 the, to the kid that, that went home. And I have a message for you in 2015. And the message is beautiful about God valuing you, God valuing you online, God, va- God valuing you on every campus. And here's the message, here's the message. You can't disappoint God. You can't disappoint God. Disappointment is the gap between expectation and reality. When we're disappointed, it's because we expected something that we didn't receive. Isn't that true? And we say, wow, I kind of expected that. And wow, I received that. And wow, it wasn't what I kind of thought it would be. And I'm a little bit surprised. I'm I'm a little bit disappointed. That's why the prodigal practiced the speech. I don't deserve to be called your son. He said, give me a bunk in the barnyard. I'll be a servant. You see, get the picture. The boy, the prodigal, was so disappointed in himself that he naturally thought the father would be disappointed in him. And I just want you to know, God's ways are higher than yours, and God's thoughts are higher than yours. And don't dumb God down. Don't dumb him down. Don't bring him down to your level of thinking. And the boy said, I know I'm disappointed. I just, I got, the father's going to be disappointed, and the father's not disappointed. In, in fact, the older brother, he can't understand why dad's throwing the party. Can I tell you something? Neither son knew the father. If they would have known the father, they would have known how much he valued his boy. And I just want you to know that To live this year of 2015 in an intentional way. Understand that God values you. And remember this when you think of the older brother. Legalism overvalues works and undervalues people. I've seen it happen throughout my entire life. People that are legalistic, they overvalue what they're doing for God. And they undervalue the people that God so beautifully, unconditionally loves. So to live a life of intentionality, know God, and know that he values you, and know, secondly, that he will take care of you, that he will take care of you. Every year, Margaret and I give our our family, our children, our grandchildren a a, a gift for Christmas, and the gift is is a trip. We we take them on a trip somewhere every year. Every year, that's that's our Christmas gift. We, We want to create memories for our kids and grandchildren. So this year we, we went and spent a week, we literally spent up to Christmas Day in, in Hawaii. And, and so we had the grandchildren there. And so Margaret and I said, let's give our grandchildren, we have five, let's give our five grandchildren a verse this year. And, and so we thought about them and talked about them and, and we prayed about it. And, and so we, we picked out a, a verse for each one of our grandchildren, a different verse based on where they are in their life, their temperament, that whole process. And then I, I looked up a quote that was similar to the verse that, that they could have. And then, and then we, we wrote a three to four line prayer for them based on that verse. And we laminated, you have to know, I laminate everything. So okay, you just, excuse me, but I just do. And, 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 and we laminate with their favorite colors. And we sat with them individually during that week. We sat down individually with them and we read the scripture. We gave them the quote. We gave them the prayer. And, and, and the theme that we had for our children this year was the theme of trust. We just want our kids to know that God is a trustworthy God. And I just want you to know, you can trust him. You can't trust yourself. You all right out there? Sometimes you can't trust others, but you can trust God. I've been thinking about what I wanted to share with you this month, and um, I thought about the, the statement that I often make, that relationships are the foundation of leadership. In other words, people won't go along with you if they can't get along with you. So let's talk about it. What is it in a um, relationship that really allows a leader to have a solid foundation to lead people really well? I wrote a book um, several years ago that's been a very practical, popular book on, on 25 ways to win with people. And it's just a book about what do you do 
to get along with people? What do you do to attract people to you? Because leaders are are people magnets. What I mean, what is it that we do that really um, allows people to want to be on your team? And I, I know, because you're in the people business, I know that, that you do some of these things very, very well. But I thought that I would, I obviously don't want to teach all of them, but I, I thought in our little monthly mentoring session today that there are you know five of them I would teach you that just, if you do it really well, you're just going to build solid foundations and you're going to win with people, that's for sure. So let's go. Number one is um, learn people's names. Um, when I was in junior high, my father gave me a book to read by Dale Carnegie, which how, how to Win Friends and Influence People. And as a seventh grader, when I read that book, he said, the name of a person is the sweetest sound that they'll ever hear. And and so he he was very strong on, on, on how to remember names. In fact, when I was a junior in high school, my father and I took a Dale Carnegie course together on remembering names, and I've made it a practice to really know how to do it. And, and let me tell you the secret of remembering names, because I run people say, oh my, that, I'm, not just, I'm just not any good at that. And, and the way that you remember names is, is you put the picture and the name together. See, if you're at a party and you're moving around and you meet this person, you meet that person, you know, after 30 minutes, you've, you've met 30 people. And there's no way that you could remember those names because you, you saw them and you, yeah, that's your name and then you're with it with someone else. But, but what would have happened when you met with them if you said, let's take a picture together? And you just do a little selfie and, and then sit down, what was your name? And you, and you put, your name, put their name on that picture. Now, what will happen is the moment that you put the name and the picture together, once you associate these, then all of a sudden you can remember the names. Because there's something visual about once you can see that face and, and that the memorization of that name is better. So I just want to encourage you. I, I one time led an organization where I literally knew over 4,000 people's names. I mean, I, I could call them my name. And it was life-changing. I mean, these people just, in fact, they did an interview one time on the on what I had built, and, and they came out and said, you know, what is the secret of a success? And I don't know what they were looking for, but most of the people, they just looked at the interviewers and said, well, he knows our name. He knows who we are. And it's just a, it's a powerful way to connect with people. Number two, if you want to really win with people, you need to compliment people in front of other people. In other words, it's one thing for me to come and say, hey, I think you're doing a really a good job. And, and by the way, a private uh, comment and compliment, it's very encouraging. But, but a, a public compliment is highly motivating. And especially what I learned is if you can do that with their family or their closest friends, I make it a, a, a real practice. I remember recently I had a, a, one of my most important team players they, they had lost, he had lost his father. And so I purposely went to the funeral to, to tell the mother and the, the siblings of this person how much Mark helped me. And, and I, I, it was such a joy to have 10 minutes to say, you, do you understand to the mother what your son has done for me in my life? And, 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 and complimenting him in front of people that he loved, it was, it was, like, it was like magic. Number three, practice what I call the 30-second rule. This is so simple. In the first 30 seconds that you're with somebody, compliment them. Say something kind about them. It may be the very fact that you've just been looking forward to seeing them again. It's, it's been a while, and you've thought all day, man, I'm, you know, I'm going to get to be with you for a few minutes. I'm going to be able to, we're going to be able to have a conversation. But it's that first 30 seconds. Make sure that you say something kind, positive, uh, you know, wonderful, beautiful about that person. Um, that's just absolutely huge. Number four, look for the best in others. Now, let's start with the negative, okay? We all have a, a bad side. We all have a, a worst in our life. I, and I don't know about you, but I really don't want to be judged or valued by my worst day. And I've had some days that were really bad. I've, I've had some days that I, I didn't do well. And I've had some days where if a person saw me and they judged me based on my behavior that day, they would say I'm not a nice person or they're certainly not one to be my friend. I, I, I would like for people 
to understand that I'm human and I have my bad days, but I want them to, to see me and look for the best in me. There is something highly um, encouraging about that. When with my with my grandchildren, with with my nieces and nephews, I all give them I give them all a nickname, and and you know when you know. For my daughter, she was the apple of my eye. For my son, he was my number one son. I, I always was giving them uh, visuals and expressions that, that would just basically say, I, I see the best in you. And what I've discovered is if you see the best in people, you receive usually the best in people. Just not, as honestly, if you see the worst in people, you, you get that negative side also. And the last thing is, is, and this is huge, just let people know that you need them. I think a lot of times leaders make a mistake of wanting to make sure that the people know that they need the leader. And of course people need leadership. I, I, I appreciate you complimenting me because this last uh, point, I'm going to uh, just bring myself right back down to ground because <laughs> John says the five signs of a solid relationship, and he, he, he finishes it with number five, trust. And uh, you were in a meeting with me recently to where I attempted to make right a, a, a situation that I feel like not only violated what I say on this podcast, I feel like it violates John's relationship, uh, John's t- content, content. I believe it violated some leaders on my team. And I think the, the, the ones that really suffered the most was our team mm. members that were lost in the reality of a lack of trust. So let me explain. And again, thank you for saying something nice about me. So people won't tune out now and go, that guy is a loser. But I, I realized something. We, we teach around here, Becky, and you know this and you live this, that when you ask somebody to do something, whether you empower them for a project or a position, mm-hmm. we established that we vetted everything we needed to vet when we assigned or empowered that responsibility to that individual and so trust is at the all-time highest it can be it's at a hundred percent john calls this for all of you podcast viewers and listeners john calls this putting a 10 on everyone's head Mm -hmm. you have a 10 you have a 10 it's yours to prove that i was wrong in putting a 10 on your head Mm -hmm. we do the same thing with trust if we have properly vetted interviewed or observed a human being to join the team or to take over ownership of a project, they deserve 100% trust. Well, I violated that. I asked somebody to handle something in our organization, actually human resources. I asked them to own it. It was owned differently at the leadership level. It was owned differently with a daily administrative level. And I never could get comfortable that they could treat human resources treat the culture that I have fought for for 22 years as good as me or a couple of people that had been around me a long time, right? Yeah. And that, that, that's normal. That's There's nothing it's bad so with that. Normal. But it's wrong. It's wrong. Yeah. And, I, and I asked them, I said, okay, it's yours. They talked me into restructuring and reassigning. And I said, okay, it's yours. It's yours. It's yours. But the whole time, every time there was a little bump or there was a little challenge or a little ripple, I'd go, hey, have you checked with this other person? Hey, why didn't you check with me on that? Mm. How many love that leader that says it's yours, but check with me before you do everything. Check with me before you think. It's not very fun. It's not very fun. (laughs) And I did this, and I did it over and over again until that leadership behavior by me began to wear out the team's ability to feel comfortable in what they knew to do to help people. And we had a huge challenge, Mm. A, a challenge that if you dealt with just the behaviors or the decisions in the in the situation would have been terrible right but fortunately for me this time i don't i wish i could get it right every time fortunately for me this time i went whoa 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 wait i don't want to talk about the details of messing it up i want to talk about what caused the missteps in the first place and what i discovered was it was my inability or my lack of determination, or my lack of commitment to give trust on the front end. I was waiting for ter- trust to be earned, mm-hmm. and by doing that and micromanaging that, I, the senior leader who had violated the trust commitment that I make with people, had created the problem. Yeah. 
Now, you said in that meeting, you watched our team really rally around that. But I, I think my biggest point that I want to make here is that truly for there to be solid relationships, for me, Becky, for you, for our team, for you, podcast listener, podcast viewer, you will not have solid relationships without this trust factor. It's true. And I don't believe trust is earned. I believe trust is given. And I believe trust is established after the leader extends trust. Yes. But so many times as leaders, we go, you got to earn my trust. Right. And in leadership, I don't believe that's accurate. It's got to be opposite. So I, I agree. The same way that um, optimistically, you always give people the benefit of the doubt until they prove you wrong and you might have to adjust some boundaries. I think trust is, should be the same way. Yep. I, and when we are equipping leaders, I mean, if you have a team of people that you're equipping as well, being able to give them that um, is everything. It's also how they see themselves through your eyes. So what you're allowing them to do is what you're telling them you believe. I'll give you an example. Um, I'm a huge University of Utah fan. My husband is alumni. We go to every football game. We buy way too many tickets, even if they're winning or losing, but I, I love it. Um, coach Whittingham, who is the head coach, there was a young man one year. His job is to it, just punt return. Like that's all he does. Catches the ball, runs it back. They punt it. He catches it. They run it back. For people that are not football fans, I'm just breaking it down. <laughs> uh, try not to get too technical. This young man um, had broken almost all the records at the school for punts returned. Uh, touchdowns. I mean, a hundred yard uh, touchdown, which is almost unheard wow. of yep. in, in football altogether. Well, there was one particular game where, again, punted off. He caught it. He ran it back, and he was it was like a 98-yard touchdown. And right before the end zone, they sometimes these young men do the celebration thing where they throw the ball back under them. And he had done that. So in his mind, he had crossed the goal line and had thrown the ball back. Well, the ref, nobody blew their whistle. Everybody in the crowd's going crazy. They're yelling. They're screaming. There's a touchdown. And the ball is on the ground. It's a live ball because wow. he never crossed the threshold with the ball, which is an actual technical touchdown. One of the kids on the other team, I mean, this is like 30 seconds, 60 seconds. Ball's just on the ground. Ref is just standing there looking at the ball and not blowing his whistle. And one of the kids on the other team realizes that's a live ball, picks it up, runs it all the way down, and the ref calls a touchdown. Wow. The whole crowd, it was silent. Have you ever been in an arena with tens of thousands of people and it's completely silent? This was that moment. Now, everybody in the crowd, after watching it on the on the big screen, thought, you better kick that kid out of the school, let alone off the field. I mean, they were just ready to take him. Coach Whittingham, as a leader, knew, because guess what happens after a touchdown? Somebody kicks the ball again, and yep. you have to return this kick. I... Coach knew to put that kid right back out on the field. Wow. I don't think there's a moment he'd probably been more mortified or questioned his ability or his ego had been bruised. I mean, it was probably the lowest of the low moment. And Coach Witt said, nope, this is your job. Brush it off. You get back out there. And you should have seen everybody in the crowd. Like, I'm pretty sure they booed their own player <laughs> yes. when he came back out. It was that bad. And that kid had to catch the ball. But as leaders, it's so easy for us to say, I'll pick it up or I'll adjust or I'll just make other arrangements. But imagine what it says to that young man to say, no, you made a mistake. Yeah. That's all that was. Yeah. And and to give them that self-confidence and to push them through. I mean, that gives you so much perspective it in does. life. I mean, whether that's your child or that's you know someone in your leadership team, but trust on both sides has to, has to work. So They've proven through time that you can earn more trust, I think, that you can give them more. You, they're capable of more. You've, you've been able to see that with your own eyes. But I think the second part to trust is forgiveness mm -hmm. because nobody's perfect. I mean, the Mark Coles, the Becky Brussels, the John Maxwells, as, right. as great intention as we have, as much as we've learned, as many books as we've read, we're still going to make mistakes. So being around people that also understand that the flip side to trust or that second phase is forgiveness yeah. and letting it go and then re-empowering. And there'll be several times that you re-empower, re-empower. Now, if you have to re-empower too much, you can start to question, sure. maybe I've given them a little too much trust in that process. And the worst thing that can happen 
is somebody who just gets really good at apologizing and doesn't get good at changing their actions. Yeah. So trust is it's a it's a big category in that aspect. It but is. The willingness, and it speaks a lot to you, Mark, the willingness to recognize that about yourself and then to share that, not just with our lead team, but to all the world and the podcast. Uh, I mean, you're just rebuilding and you're, you, you've you're reaffirmed, establishing trust. You've reaffirmed yeah. it. And it is an ongoing process. It's not something you do once. It's it's not like you got married at the altar and now it's fine. You don't have to work on it at all. Yeah. Like, it's a relationship. It's definitely going to take time. When you were talking about uh, what the coach did, and then also you made a comment that it is not perfection. I, mm-hmm. I was reminded of the John Mark Green uh quote that says a great relationship requires deep connection not perfection absolutely and i think that's what we've attempted in this podcast the last two episodes we've really attempted to tell you that what john said in the book 21 laws of leadership this law of connection law number 10 it really is a game changer it really is absolutely what we believe is kind of the linchpin, the, the, the piece that will make the difference for you in your leadership is your ability to connect. Well, today's topic is how leaders move from good to great. Mm-hmm. And there's a book, you know, about good to great. We're going to talk today a little bit about how do leaders do that? How are you, know, are you a good leader? Are you a great leader? How do you move the needle to become a great leader? There's so many factors that really distinguish a good leader from a great leader. And in some of the research that we've done and, and Perry's looked at uh, by Jack Zanger and, and Joe Folkman, some of the factors are improve communication effectiveness, encourage others. We, we talk about that on here to grow and to improve, be a role model, uh, be a champion for your team, uh, recognize when change is needed. Otherwise, you'll become irrelevant. And then finally, the last one we have on here is a pro- improve your ability to inspire and motivate those that are in your influence. Lots of good stuff. And um, Dr. Zanger and Dr. Folkman doing this research, what they did was they took 360-degree feedback data uh, and looked at uh, the critical skills of leaders who were progressing uh, most in their leadership, and they pulled these uh, these topics out. The one that I thought and it's so key to what we talk about anyway that I thought we should uh, maybe go a little deep on today was about um, about lead, you know uh, communication effectiveness. Um, I think how you communicate really mm. affects your reputation as yeah. a leader. And I wanted to get today. I want to get practical. I love it. So I'm gonna we'll talk about some of the concepts, but how do we actually get practical about that? And I'd like you to walk away from this uh, time you invest with other day to one or three things that you can work on between now and uh, with working with your team. So that's is that okay with you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely love that. So the first way to increase communication effectiveness effectiveness is to become. A better listener. Okay, hang on a minute. <laughs> I just heard that, were that were those radios clicking off. And <laughs> that's right. Players. That's right. No, that no one think, wants to do that. I know. No, they all no, think they're. I'm a great listener. Yeah. What, are you kidding me? Yeah. I'm a fantastic listener. As my wife says all the time, right? I know you hear me. You're just not listening to me. <laughs> so uh, I think that there is room for all of us. And what's really key about this is that we often ask a question in some of our training. And we say, we play this would you rather you know, game in essence. Uh, what's more important, to be a better uh, communicator or, or an effective listener? And, and then we challenge them. We say, well, whichever one you pick, right? you have to pick this or that. Um, you, you can't use the other word as you're describing you know, why you picked the answer that you did. And it's always fun because especially when you get to this one and you talk about communication and, and everybody's right, it's a trick question. They go, well, I can't do that because... They're one and the same. They, they, you know, listening is part of communication, and they're spot on. And we do it, and we have fun with it, and we talk about how, you know, really there's a two way pathway in regards to communication, and that that second pathway is to really become a better listener. You can be a great communicator, but if you're not listening to what you need to communicate, then then it's going to be it's not going to be very effective, or vice versa. You can be a great listener, but if you're not, you don't have the ability to communicate. And so I love that we're going to dive into this and really unpack how do we incre- increase our communication effectiveness. And the first one is to become a better listener. Well, I find that listening is the number one way to show you value someone. Mm. Uh, you're giving something you can't get back, which is time uh, to do that. I think when a leader invests 
time in uh, actively listening to their people, that it, it, it uh, demonstrates respect. It, um, you begin to understand team members' points of view. You begin to understand how they think. Uh, I just think that when you begin to truly appreciate a team member's perspective, uh, you do that through, uh, yeah, I mean, you can add so much to your own thinking by just listening and asking good questions and listening actively to what your team members are telling yeah. you. So um, most people think they're better listeners than they really are, as we were joking about a minute ago. Uh, so I really wanted to get practical about, are there some things, even if you think you're okay listening, do you think you could get better? I know yeah. I could. Yeah. And so what are some of those ideas? And I thought we could bat that about. I, I think that when you become intentional about improving your listening skills, um, it will absolutely increase your connection with people, your influence with people. Uh, we we joke all the time about our spouses who um, are our only two listeners <clears throat> to the podcast <laughs> about how you and I could do a much better job uh, of listening. And I think it's something that if we all slowed down and we removed distractions, we could all get better at. But man, we live in a time and a pace where things are moving faster than they've ever moved before. Social media and devices are everywhere and, and it's a it's a problem. I even think about the fact that um, I have a couple of nephews that are are staying with us this week and we love it. We have fun with them. And and so I begin to watch the the difference in generations and the influences that are in their life take away from their ability to listen. Um, and so, man, I think this is going to be something as we move forward in organizations that we need to continue to focus on. And so here are a couple of things uh, practically to really look at. We're just talking about electronic devices. Put your phone away when you're having a conversation mm -hmm. with somebody. There's nothing worse than having a, a conversation with somebody and their phone is right there and they keep glancing at their phone and it's buzzing and it keep going off. Man, if it's gonna if it's gonna be doing that, it's not a problem. Just try to put that away. Re, uh, remain in eye contact with the individual. Mm -hmm. Have that connection with them while you're listening. Um, give them your complete attention. I'll never forget when I was much younger, someone said the greatest thing that you could do is when you're listening to somebody is for them to think, holy cow, there's a lot of stuff going on right now and it seems like nothing else matters but our conversation because you're giving them complete attention. And then don't interrupt them. Oh man, this like this is one of the things that just bothers me um, is that when I am speaking um, or I and watching a conversation and somebody just keeps interrupting a conversation, allow them to finish that. And then finally, take notes from what you're hearing from them. I'll never forget, I was I was at a, an event one time and John uh, was speaking. And so we were there, it was a client of ours and it's a, a CEO of a, of, a, of a very large company. And John was interviewing this CEO on leadership up on stage and uh, John was asking the questions and then just feverishly taking notes listening intently but taking notes and so we we're on the ride home we you know to the airport and and i said john talk to me a little bit i haven't seen you do that before talk to me a little bit about what was behind you taking notes and uh and during that interview and he said oh i'm, I'm working right now on becoming a better listener i'm looking at becoming better engaged and when i find myself having to think about what they're saying to be able to take notes um, it makes me listen better. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting. And so taking notes allows you to do that. The other thing that I think is key here is that, yes, this will help you from uh, from a communication standpoint. But this, all of these things that we have laid out here, they're going to add value to the person that's talking to you. Mm -hmm. They're going to they're gonna think, man, I'm important. Uh, I'm engaged in this conversation. So just some practical ways to do that to improve your listening. I listen to you talk about, yeah, put my phone away, but you also need to master your wrist. I am so tired oh, of people. Oh, that's so good. While I'm talking to someone, they look at their <laughs> watch, but they're not checking the time, although they may be, and that, yeah. which, which sends me a very bad message. Yeah. But it may be worse. Yeah, yeah. 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 I don't have to pull out my phone. Oh. I can just look at my wrist because that's where all my. Oh no, don't do that. And I was also so the, the the skill the skill of curiosity is mm -hmm. one that many leaders need to work on. Is that when someone's talking to me, can I become curious about? What did I'm curious. What is the point they're trying to make? I'm curious. Well, how does this apply to what we're talking about? I'm curious, and it just makes me a little bit deeper in my thinking and listening. Uh, and then also, uh, I got some coaching on this. Was I'm trying to formulate instead of my response to what you're saying. I'm trying to formulate what's the best question I can ask when you're done, 
and thought, before I give my mm-hmm. response, I need to ask one question. And, and it could be a follow-up. It could be something. But it, can I – Can I, uh, I also like little phrases uh, that help me. Uh, I use, uh, tell me more. Uh, what happened next? And then what did you do? And most people are f- just floored that you would encourage them to keep talking because most they're, – they're used to – waiting people waiting for them to take a breath so they could jump in and talk and instead i said well tell me more yeah. what happened next i also hear you say quite a bit lately which i love which is i i have a point of view on that <laughs> what's your point of view yeah, i love that right I and i, I love that i love how you yeah. position that so that they can you can continue to listen more what they're doing leaders you know better than anyone that growth is essential if you want to make tomorrow better. growth.maxwellleadership.com That's growth.maxwellleadership.com. Another way, uh, improving communication effectiveness uh, and raise your leadership influence, become intentional about your nonverbals, like body language, uh, facial expression, tone of voice, um, all the ways that uh, people are reading (laughs) you as they're communicating. Um, You know, we talk about you're always making people feel something. What is it you make people feel? So when you're someone's talking to you, or when you're talking to someone, let's, let's keep it on listening. Someone's talking to you. What are you doing with your face? What yeah. are you doing with your your body language? Are you facing them? Are you facing the door? Are you you know rolling your eyes? Are you get your hands on your hips? You're, what th- there's positives and negatives about all that, but I think it really affects so much about how people feel. Are they being heard mm. or? Are they? Are you just tolerating and waiting for your time to speak? Yeah, this is uh, so good for me personally just to even go through this because I'll get lazy at times listening, and I know this, uh, but maybe my actions don't necessarily show that. And so, again, we're in the leadership space. This is what we do every day. Uh, we're in the communication space, and yet you're you're challenging me with some of the things that we're talking about here today. And so as you're listening to this podcast, I hope that you're being challenged as well to become a, a better listener. One other thing in regards to this is, do you have empathetic communication style? Mm-hmm. You guys know what I'm talking about. There are those that do and those that don't when it comes across that way. And, and empathy in your communication means that you're, you're, you have the ability and you can relate to the individual and maybe not exactly what they're going through, right? Uh, but you can get into that place with them and you can be empathetic during a conversation. And when you do this, it no doubt increases your ability to connect with people and then will increase your influence as a, a leader. Um, when you were just talking about mind your mind your face, I love it when you say that, right? Like what what is that what is that what is that face telling people? Yeah. I was having this conversation just recently, within the last week with a leader, and we were talking about as conversations happen, um, the facial expressions will change. And um, somebody said to this individual, like, what, what's going on with the face? Like, and, and he, and he said back to, we've, we've, we've worked together for how long? Like, you know, this is just, and so they kind of started laughing about it. And then he said, oh, let me tell you another funny story about kind of the mind your face as you're talking about this and, and listening. He said that some of his team want the masks to be a policy of, uh, what they have to wear while they're working because it covers his face and they don't have to look at his oh facial expressions gosh. while he's listening or communicating to the team. That's the power of what you're talking about here in connecting through communication. Um, and whether you have empathy or, or not is, you know, is mind your face. Do you smile? Do you welcome people? Are you approachable? Or are you not? Yeah. Empathy versus sympathy. <laughs> yeah. oh, can I feel for you or do I feel sorry for you? Uh, that people can tell if you're relating to them. Uh, another great way to improve, uh, improve your communication effectiveness was to uh, master this skill. I call it a skill mm-hmm. of providing regular feedback to those you work with. And uh, when you provide constructive feedback, uh, you communicate that you care about me, that uh, you you want to see me grow and improve. And I think, uh, unfortunately, many leaders shy away from this because they fear the conflict it might cause. They don't want to give bad news. Yeah. I don't know what the, I've heard many reasons for this, but uh, done correctly, I believe that feedback uh, can be your friend is a great way to really find the greatness in other people. And so when you say my communication style, if, if you expect 
that when you're with me and we're we're performing in our role, that I'm going to give you feedback and that I expect feedback from you. Do do you think that makes mm. my, raises my reputation as a leader? I think so. I think yeah. people turn to expect say, Perry, what do you think? And that's what I'll use. So well, I have a point of view, but what do you think? Because yeah. yeah. uh, I want to hear what they think first. But get practical on that one. I love know, that. Feedback. So let's talk about this feedback. We've all heard of the feedback sandwich, right? Like, and and the reason that we really do it, and this is this is so good, is that we really do that because it makes us feel better about giving the <laughs> that's feedback. What, that's what I've learned. Yes, <laughs> um, they know what you're doing, by the way, right? Yeah, yeah. And and so they probably have their guard up even more, and they're not even listening. And explain to the, the feedback sandwich. Is- so where you end up giving somebody something mm-hmm. positive. Then some constructive feedback, and then you close with a positive comment, and we can get out as quickly as possible. And then you I, get out as quickly as possible. <laughs> now yeah. I feel better about myself. Yeah, that's right. And so, man, I I, I gave him two positive things, one negative. And so, to your point uh, here is that, man, yeah, absolutely. I think that that is more for you than at them. So I've heard you teach and talk about um, getting away from the feedback sandwich and talking more about a feedback conversation. That's right, right. And the feedback conversation goes like this. As close to an event that you've w- witnessed as possible as a leader, share something that you thought the person did well, then share something you think they might have done better, and then ask the question, which you were just talking about a minute ago, which is, what did you think about that? Mm-hmm. So you're you're creating this dialogue versus giving statements on that, that sandwich, and you're inviting them to have a conversation. And that is a much different approach to a topic than just having the feedback sandwich. Oh, it's worked amazing for me is that, um, hey, that sales call, I thought you did a great job on engaging the client, uh, the prospect in a conversation. One area I thought you could have improved on with how you presented our value proposition. What do you think? And the salesman looks right at me and says, no, I thought it was great. What are you kidding me? I go, well, I really, I I thought some confusion on the customer's face Mm -hmm. and I was just observing, but maybe I'm wrong. How did you see it? And he goes, well, now that you mentioned it, I did get a little tangled up and I, I was very vague on a couple of things and I really wasn't sure how to, I said, well, t- tell me, how can we, uh, how can we have done it differently? And now we're in a beautiful great. place. I'm having That's a great, great conversation. And he actually, <laughs> the salesman, what salesman ever did this? Is says, hey, would you do a role play with me on that? Nobody ever asked Nobody. for a role play. Yeah. I thought, yeah, let's, let's role play that for a moment. How could you give me the value prop <laughs> to, to do that? So, um, Another area I think can improve your reputation as a leader and your increase your influence and increase your communication is, and we talk about it a lot here, but I think it really applies, is those three questions that mm-hmm. every follower, every uh, person you're listening to is asking about you while you're leading, while you're influencing them. Do you remember the three questions? No. Okay. I'm not listening. <laughs> you do. I'm just kidding. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So what they want to know is, hey, are you going to help them? Um, do you care about them yep. and can they trust you? Yeah. Love these. And this is a staple of, of John and, and really what, when he talks about leadership and connecting with people. And so these are a great way to frame your question. Now, what we want you to know is, man, if you're, if you can answer yes, or these questions are being answered yes about your leadership, then your communication is in a pretty good place and, and you have the ability to Im- increase your influence and your reputation as a leader. The, the getting practical behind this and why we put this in here is if the answer to any of those three questions is no, then dig into that. Why is it no? Why is it, why is it that um, it is no? What, what can you be doing or working on to move that from a no to a yes? They're simple questions, and it's a simple answer, yes or no. If it's yes, hey, keep trudging, keep getting better. But if it's no, we really want you to kind of unpack and look into that. Yeah, fantastic. And and then finally, I, I just thought that, you know, John's new book out on mm. the 16 Undeniable Laws of Communication, I was really taken uh, by a truth uh, in one of the laws there was that uh, the, the law of credibility that, you know, great communicator knows that you're not the main attraction. It's the, all your communication is about others. And if you make it about yourself, you, if you're talking in a way that um, makes it about you, you're not making it meaningful for others. So I thought for me, that was a great reminder is that in my communication, is it about others? Am I talking to other? Am I, am I listening with respect to others? Uh, lots of things that make up a great communicator, but being credible in your communication mm-hmm. um, by the life you live and the way that you present yourself and then you make it about others. 
it goes a long way. It goes a long way. Well, as we wrap up, remember, we started this by talking about how leaders move from good leadership to great leadership. And I love that you said, hey, let's just take one and let's get really practical. What's interesting is that one, when we work with organizations, we go through a discovery process and no doubt about it, the top in the top three every time, and you know this, mm -hmm. you've been on a lot of discovery calls, is man, listen, we got to get better at communication as leaders. We have leaders that don't do a good job of communicating. As an organization, we don't do a good job of communicating. So here were just a couple of very practical, simple ways. Go back, listen, have a little bit of an assessment, check yourself on these areas that we brought to you. And I promise you, if you work on becoming a, a more effective communicator by some of the tips that we get, that, that we gave you, you will go from being a good leader to a great leader. Welcome to the Maxwell Leadership Executive Podcast, where our goal is to help you increase your reputation as a leader, increase your ability to influence others, and increase your ability to fully engage your team to deliver remarkable results.